Anne Rice has sold more than 100 million novels. Her Vampire Chronicles and Mayfair Witch have earned her large and loyal following. She penned her first novel in 1976 with Interview with the Vampire. Her more recent work, Servant of the Bones and Violin, explored other realms of the supernatural. Her latest book, Pandora, returns to the world of blood drinkers and begins the new tales of the vampires. As always, we're very pleased to have her back at this table. Welcome back. Well, thank you very much, Sorry, Charlie. So it's a pleasure to be here, and you've got my sympathy. <laughs> I'm going to make the questions very short. Sure, you'll you give go me right your ahead. Best large yeah. answers. Uh, first off, what about this deal from Bartlesman buying Random House, which includes Kanaf, huh? Well, that was a big shock. Uh, I was in the office yesterday when that news came down that Bertelsmann had bought uh, Random House. But uh, I think it's going to be, I don't think it's going to have any effect on an author like me. I don't think it's going to have any effect on those of us who are with Knopf. Knopf, as you know, is one of the uh, most distinguished imprints in the company. We're under the Random House umbrella. And as long as we have Sunny Met as our president, I have Vicky, Victoria Wilson as my editor and vice president. I have uh, Linda Gray running Ballantyne, who does all the paperback copies of my books. I think we're going to be really unaffected. That's Knopf and Ballantyne together that I'm speaking of. And other than that, I really don't know a lot about Bertels, Monty. I, I know that we're going from one privately owned entity, Cy Newhouse, to another privately owned entity, which is Bertelsmann. And I know that we're going from one man who was interested in books and magazines to another entity that's interested in books and magazines. So I think that's good. I think that's very good. Now, I've heard complaints outside, you know, of my realm and my world that other agents and other authors are a little upset because when you have a house as big as this house is now going to be, I mean, it's now going to have uh, Random House as the umbrella company, but it'll have the Random House imprint, it'll have the Knopf imprint, it'll have Pantheon, it'll have Crown, it'll have Vintage, it'll also have Ballantine. <clears throat> I mean, it has Ballantine already, excuse me. Um, uh, it will now have uh, Bantam, Delacord, uh, and, and Double Day, and I think there's some others in there that I'm forgetting. Well, that's that's a lot under one roof. So and they're so, worried there would be not as much competitive bidding as there might be otherwise. Exactly. Agents want to have a lot of choices for their authors. Authors want to have a lot of choices for their books. For me, as I said, it's not going to have any effect. I'm, I've, I've been with Knopf, if you can believe it, 20 years. I've been with them since 1976. Oh. This, this book, Pandora, for example, is uh, part of a new contract to do a short book every spring. Uh, I sold them on this idea. It was, it was my bright idea that we, we keep doing the big book that we do every fall. And, uh, and as you know, some of these books of mine, the Witching, the Witching Hour, for example, is as big as the phone book. Yeah. And we, I wanted to continue the Vampire Chronicles in the fall, the, the adventures of the whole clan of the vampires and what they were doing. But I also wanted to do something in the spring that was more like a novella. Um, although many people today publish a novel that size and call it a novel. To me, it's a novella. It's about 300 pages. Yeah. And it gives me an opportunity to take some of the background characters, some of the old characters, some of the characters that I've hinted about and, and brought on for little cameo appearances. It gives me an opportunity to take them now, put them in the forefront, and tell adventures in their lives and tell of escapades in their lives. And that's really what I've done with Pandora. Who is Pandora? Well, Pandora first appeared in the Vampire Lestat. She's mentioned by Marius. Marius is supposed to be 2,000 years. He is 2,000 years old. What do I mean supposed to be? He's 2,000 years old. He's a child of the millennia. He, um, he's, a very, he's the mentor who can answer all of Lestat's questions. And he mentions in the Vampire Lestat that there was a great love of his life who was the vampire Pandora, but that he's lost track of her that he doesn't know where she is. Now, that was in the 18th century. Then, when I came back in The Queen of the Damned, which was the sequel to that novel, Pandora appeared in the 20th century, making her way toward Marius, making her way toward Lestat, making her way to a big sort of confab of the vampires. But again, she remained a sort of mysterious character. But this book begins in Paris in what year, 1997? It, it begins right now, right yeah. now in Paris. And this is Pandora now, today, being persuaded by one of the younger vampires to tell her story. You know, he brings her a notebook. They meet in a Paris cafe. It's raining. He bring, It's always raining in my novels. <laughs> it's New Orleans. It's always raining in New Orleans. It's raining in Paris, too. And David brings her a notebook. He says, Pandora, please write down for me everything that happened, you know, to you. And at first she says, impossible. Who is da David Talbot? David Talbot is, is a newly made vampire from the tales of the body thief. See, I'm developing, what I'm developing is a whole cast here that I can move around with. I, I never planned this in 1976. Mm -hmm. I never dreamed I would do this. Anyway, David persuades Pandora 
Pandora then begins to write. She goes all the way back to the Rome of Caesar Augustus, and she begins to tell her story. And she really tells in this little book just the first hundred years, really, the first hundred years of how, how she was born, how she grew up, how she was made a vampire by Marius. And I really, really deeply got into the history in this. The history of Rome. The history of Rome. And you know, I, I tend to get into the history in all these books. I love to do research. I love to put these imaginary characters in concrete and real places. But in this book in particular, I, I did something which I have not done before. I kind of brought together the minds of the characters with the history of the times. This is really a Roman lady. She thinks like a Roman lady. She's sophisticated. She's very, very broad-minded. She's, uh, I wouldn't say, she's agnostic. She is, which I think most sophisticated Romans were. I think they had become rather superstitious about their religion, but th they weren't really very, it didn't enter into their rational or ethical life that much. She's really like that. And Marius is like that. And I had a lot of fun toying with their, their, their ideological arguments. Christianity, you know, comes to the, to the fore during the time that they're together. And they have terrific arguments about Christianity. Pandora's extremely curious about it, says this is something worth looking into, it's very mysterious. The vampire Marius, very, very old guard Roman mind, says no, 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 it's an irrational Eastern cult, I don't want anything to do with it, it's nonsense, everything that comes out of the East is wacko, it's coming from Palestine, get out of here. Well, never before have I had my characters so rooted in the mindset of the age. And so that was a challenge, and that was fun. <laughs> How did you find out about Roman history? Oh, read and read and read. Just bought one book after another, read everything I could find. I went to the original sources. I read what I could of Ovid. I read what I could. I can't claim to have read all of them. You know, I read Plutarch's Lives. Uh, then I went to the books about Rome, Roman emperors, Roman, Roman architecture. I had been to Italy. Well, I've been to Italy now four times. And on one of my trips, I had been all through Pompeii, the ruins at, south of Naples, and I had walked through the ruins of these Roman houses and villas. So I had a wonderful time creating Pandora's houses. You know, I knew just where rooms would be and so forth. It was, it was, it was tremendous fun. It was also the first time I've ever written about a female vampire at any length. I've usually... Why is that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's psychological. There's no, there's no question about it. There's some deep, deep psychological reason. It's easier to write about a male creeping around at night, getting into trouble, climbing over walls, going into back alleys. But I was able to do that with this woman. I was able to make her very strong and very independent and very free and really develop a good voice for her. And uh, I, I'm not sure why that Did was. Did you give her all these characteristics that you admire and... I made her. I made her somebody I like very much. She's very plucky, and she's. Would, you, would we use that word for a man, plucky? So that may be a sexist distinction. I'm not sure, but she's she's very strong. And she she at, at one point she is thrown on her own. The family is murdered Roman style. They fall out of grace with the emperor, and they, you know, the, all the men are murdered. And she has to get out of Rome and go places on her own. And she's got money. But the question is how to set up a life. This is long before the vampire blood enters That's the picture. That's what I want to ask you. When does she discover that she likes the blood? Well, she doesn't really. What she, she discovers her old friend Marius, and Marius has subsequently been transformed into a vampire. And she becomes, she sort of gets ensnared with the vampires. And then Marius is placed in a position where he really has to make her a vampire or watch her die because she's been attacked by one of the others. And, and you know, I, I don't want to give away all the secrets. How do you make somebody a vampire? You, a blood exchange, a deep blood exchange. You have to, it's not simply, you know, you don't just bite the person on the neck. It's, you know, you have to really exchange uh, blood. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a long, drawn-out process. Mm -hmm. And when you do it, you do it by choice. So th this is all my mythology that I've been developing for 20 years. Does and, anyone and else do this like you do it? Gee, I don't no, know. No, you know, that I, has the same fascination and who writes about it, not as well and not as certainly not as commercially successful, but has this huge, huge curiosity, fascination, and also capacity to, to make the characters come alive. I really don't know, Charlie. I really don't know. I know for me... you must hear from everybody who just, I mean, they read these books for some reason, other, other, in addition to the fact that you're a great storyteller. 
Well, what I hear, what I hear from people more, more or less, I, you know, I have an open fan, not fan line, forgive me, I have an open reader line at home that people can call. It's listed under Anne Rice, and they can leave a message for me on the machine. And they frequently leave messages about what they like or they don't like about the characters. But most of the time, they're so close to the work that they don't really give me an insight into why it works for all of them. They'll just call up and say, what is Lestat going to do next? Why has Armand not come back? Where is David? Why don't you mention Gabrielle? And they'll talk about them like they're real people. Well, what is the fascination, you think, with vampires? Well, I don't, think, I don't think in the case of my readers it's totally with vampires. I think it's with these characters. Yeah. I really do. I think it's with the personalities of these characters. The fact that they're vampires adds tremendous charm for the readers. These are, these are elegant, ele yes, these are elegant creatures of the night. They go around in a melancholy so frame of mind. So it makes them sort of mind. exotic and erotic. Exactly. And they feel very guilty about taking human life. They try to prey only on the evildoer if they possibly can. They dress beautifully. They, they, they love beauty, they love sensuality. So there's a great deal of romance when we, when we give a signing. A lot of the kids come dressed in velvet and they come dressed in lace and they'll, they'll wear period costumes. They'll say, I'm Lestat from the 18th century. Or, um, you know, they'll come dressed as maybe one of the Mayfair witches. The same, the same thing applies to those characters in that book. What do you read for pleasure when you're not for pleasure, I, actually, I don't. I I delve into history for pleasure, and I have to con confess that lately I've been terrifically involved in the news for for pleasure and pain. I've been watching breathlessly the controversy surrounding President Clinton and his various, ad, uh, uh, well, non-adventures or adventures or whatever they are, alleged adventures, and and that's that's what I do more or less with my time. If I'm what do not you think of all that. Well, I'm squarely in the president's corner. I believe I believe very strongly in the president of the United States, and I and I have to confess that I'm I, I'm very alarmed at this point uh, about the accusations of Miss Willie and 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 uh, and Miss Tripp and Miss Jones because I think they're making us as women look bad. I want equality for women. I want women to be strong. I want us to have equal rights. I want us to be perceived as honorable people. I want us to be perceived as consistent people, as people with integrity, people who know their own minds. And I don't like what I hear right now. I don't. I don't like the kind of, you know, the kind of the kind of charges that are being made. The seeming inconsistency with somebody like Miss Willie, who was working on a book deal and then working with the tabloids, and then you know seemed to have given the president the impression at one point that whatever happened in the Oval Office on that fateful day was okay, but now years later she decides it's not okay, you know, whatever it was. I'm, I'm very, very, I'm very, very puzzled by the whole thing. I really want... Hard to know what's true in it. I want the president to run the country. I want him to be the leader of the free world. Morality to me is feeding the hungry, it's sheltering the homeless, it's protecting us from germ warfare, it's caring about getting Medicare to people who are younger. Perhaps the president said about three or four days ago that he wanted to get Medicare to people who are 55 years of age. That's really what concerns me. I think that's a great idea. And, and, and I admire, I admire the, the courage of the president to move right along past this kind of tabloid politics and to just keep doing his job. But in the end, my feeling is that if some of this was true, whatever part of it, and even what, and not in the same context that's alleged, it wouldn't really bother you because you feel yeah. really good about this guy. So well, that's that's actually true. It's his personal life. If it's yeah. okay with Hillary Clinton, it's okay with me. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's the man's personal life. Right. That's really that's really the thing. And I think if 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 Bill Clinton comes out of this all right, which I believe he is going to, I think it's going to strengthen the presidency because I think we'll realize that that these charges cannot bring down the president. That it's going to take a great deal more than this, a great deal of substantially more than this to bring down the president. I think. That's, that'll be good. Very, very good. Uh, you've got another novel coming out. Armand is coming out in the That's fall. That's right. The That's vampire one of the big Armand. ones, huh? The Vampire Armand, right? And that'll be my big vampire chronicle, and that'll be out on Halloween. And what's the next movie? Oh, the next movie. I have no idea. It could be The Mummy. It could be the sequel to... It could be The is Vampire Lestat. Is Geffen going to make the, the others or someone else? No, Geffen's gone off to DreamWorks, and now we're at Warner Brothers, and uh, one, of my, one, of my, one of the nice, nice irons in the fire that I have is that James Cameron happens to be the owner of The Mummy. Who's so that? So <laughs> I'm really thrilled. And last, you know, on the Academy Awards when Jim, when Jim won for the Titanic, I mean, I was just absolutely... Uh, the Mummy was thrilled. on the Titanic and I, escaped. I hope that he turns to The Mummy next. I don't know 
know if he will. He's too busy now for me to ask. It's just not polite to ask when a man is enjoying the kind of success that he's enjoyed with the Titanic. By the way, I enjoyed him very much when he was on your show. Thank I you. Was, I was riveted during that discussion. But maybe The Mummy will be next. I hope so. Thank you for coming. Fabulous. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank Anne Rice's new Charlie. novel is Pandora. We'll be right back. Stay with us.